ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ان اوثنتك حديث that is well known to most of us is collected by Imam Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. The companion Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, he reported that the Prophet وسلم, said, In al Islam, Bada'a Gariban wa Sayyarud Gariba Fatuba Lil Ghurabai. Verily, al Islam began as a stranger, it begins strange. And it's going to return strange. So glad tidings of the Jannah, or a tree in the Jannah called Tuba. Glad tidings for the people who are upon this strangeness. This hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been mentioned many times. Many of us who embrace this religion, this is one of those hadith we used to hear at the beginning of Al-Islam. And his hadith is from the mu'jizat of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's from his Jawami' Al-Kalim. And the meaning of the hadith has far-reaching implications. When Al-Islam came to the Arabian Peninsula, it was strange because the people didn't know what it was about. It went against their life the way to dress, how to believe, the things that they took for granted as being part of their culture and their way of life. When Al-Islam came, it was strange to them. So anyone during that time who made a conscious effort to choose Islam as his way of life, as his religion during that time, he was going to make a decision that was a life-altering decision. It's a dr drastic decision. He's going to ruffle the feathers of the people who are around him and the environment that he's in. He's going to ruffle the feathers of the people who know him. Any and everyone who's not on the same page that that individual is on when he accepted Islam, he's going to ruffle their feathers and they're going to ruffle his feathers. That's the strangeness of Al-Islam at the beginning, at the beginning. And now it's going to return strange, meaning Towards the end of time, like now, until Yom al Qiyamah, Al Islam is strange. To practice Islam correctly is strange. Anyone who does it, he's going to be looked at as being strange. We have the general meaning in that as Muslims, they see us as being strange because our women dress a particular way. We behave a particular way. There are things we do, things that we don't do. So, generally speaking, we are those strangers. But when Islam comes back, it's going to be strange even to the people who are practicing Islam. If you practice Islam correctly, you're going to be strange to the most religious person here. Somebody here is the most religious person here. If an individual tries to practice Islam the correct way, and I'm talking about with ease, not going overboard, people are going to look at you and they're going to say, what are you doing? You're too rough. You're too tough. You're going overboard. And he's just doing the basics, the way he maintains and the way he is. Certainly this hadith of the strangeness of Al-Islam, I have to mention that some people misunderstand this hadith and that they restrict it and they reduce it just to mean Al-Islam is going to return strange, meaning in Aqidah and in Minhaj. Aqidah and Minhaj. And we have people who believe this because every time people talk about the Firqat al-Najiyah and the Ta'ifa al-Nunsura, the saved sect, 
the victorious sect that the Prophet used to tell us about, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, commanded us to be from that group, make it your efforts and your business to try to be from that group. People always mention this hadith of the Ghuraba, this hadith of strangeness, because it's a synonym for the Firqat al Najiyah and the Ta'if al Mansura. And that's true, it does mean that, but it's not correct to restrict this hadith just to Aqidah and just to Minhaj. Because the Prophet didn't say that. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al Islam is going to return as a stranger. And Islam is the whole religion. And the Minhaj and Aqidah is part of the religion. We made for every prophet and messenger, every nation that went before you, we gave them a Sharia and a Minhaj. The Sharia is part of Islam, the Minhaj is part of Islam, they're two different things. There are other things in El Islam. The whole religion is going to be strange when it comes back, if it comes back in its practice in the correct way. If it's being practiced the right way. And that tremendous hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that Imam al Nawawi put in his book for the hadith of Imam al Nawawi, hadith number three, the hadith of Abdullah bin Umar, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or radiyallahu an ashabi ajma'een, he mentioned that Al Islam has been built upon five pillars. Well known hadith. And he gave the five pillars of Al Islam the shahadatain, the salat, the zakat. And Psalm and Hajj, five things. But those five things are not all of Islam. That's from his Jawam al Kalim. That the main essentials that the religion is built upon is these five things. But that's not all of Islam. If anything is built upon something and has a foundation, then it's going to have walls, it's going to have floors, it's going to have a roof, it's going to have its peak, its apex, it's going to have all of that. It's going to have some rooms, going to have some windows. So Islam has all of that. And that's from the way he used to teach Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because everybody can appreciate building. He said Islam is built upon five things. The foundation. But he told us from Islam, Inna min husni, Islam in mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'nihi. From a person's good Islam is leaving alone that which doesn't concern him. So we have the five pillars of Islam. And also from Al Islam is minding your own business. That's from Islam. Mind your own business. So the five pillars are not all of Islam. That's the point. They came and said, Ya Rasulullah, ayyul Islam afdal. What is the best Islam? I want the best Islam. He said, Man salim al Muslimun, min nisanihi wa yadihi. The best Islam, the best Muslim, is the one who the other Muslims are protected from his tongue and his hands. So part of Islam is, don't hurt people, don't hit people, don't steal from people, don't make ghiba namima, don't lie on people, don't curse people, don't swear at people. So back to the point of the hadith of the strangeness of Al-Islam. This hadith is not talking about aqid and minhaj only. It's talking about all of Al-Islam. It's going to be strange. It began as a strange thing and it's going to come back as a strange thing. The companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started complaining about this strangeness doing their lives. At the end of their lives and their era, they begin to explain and they begin to complain about this strangeness. And if it was the case back then, then we have to imagine what's the reality right now. And we'll come to that, inshallah. One of the great tabi'een, his name is Muhammad ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. He traveled to Asham where Anas ibn Malik was, he went in to meet Anas ibn Malik, he saw Anas ibn Malik crying and in a state of being upset, and he had sorrow. He said, what is it that makes you cry? Anas ibn Malik said, Wallahi, la a'rafu shay'in mimma adraktum illa hadihi as-salat. When the salat qad he said, I swear by Allah, this man is from the Tabi'een. Anas is from the companions. He said, I don't recognize anything that you people are doing that we used to do during the time of the Prophet. What was the religion? I don't recognize that you people from the Tabi'een are being similar to what we used to do. And he was complaining about the difference in the two eras and the two different times. 
The other Imam, Al Hassan Al Basri, also from the Tabi'een, a contemporary of Al Imam Al Zuhri, he said in an authentic statement to the other Tabi'een of his time, Wallahi, Lo Kharaja, Ashabu Nabi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alaikum, La Yarefuna illa Qiblatukum. I swear by Allah, if the companions of the Prophet came right now, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during that time of the Tabi'een, he said he, he wouldn't, they wouldn't know anything and recognize anything about what you're doing other than the Qibla that you're praying towards. He didn't say the Salat. He said the Qibla. Because everybody's sitting this way and everybody's facing the Qibla. So they'll know the Qibla is that way. As for the prayer, they're not going to know the prayer. And that's because there are many things inside of the prayer that should be done. Many things concerning the prayer that shouldn't be done. And during that time... People started to do the things in the prayer that shouldn't be done, and they stopped doing the things that should have been done. That was during the time of the Tabi'een. What do you think is the reality right now? You all know, inshallah, that the Prophet وسلم, when it came to his ghusl, he wanted to make a ghusl for Juma, he wanted to make ghusl for Salat. After having relationships, he wants to make a ghusl. They said that the Prophet وسلم, used to make a ghusl with a saw of water. That's just a kidder, like a pot, a small pot. He would make that ghusl from that. During our time, we can't imagine that. It's almost impossible for a person to do something like that. Today, the wudu of a person is going to be more than that, the water that he uses. If the companions came back now and the companions saw the amount of water that a person uses just to make one wudu, they're going to say, what salat are you preparing for? Are you preparing for the salat of al-Islam or the salat at taqlidiya the salat of taqlid? I can say I prayed and khalas with Allah, I prayed. But did you pray that salat, that real salat of al-Islam, that if the Muslims hold on to it, they've been guaranteed victory? Companions, they would see it as something really strange. Even right now, from amongst us, you know with the water bills that we have and we complain cause a lot of money to supply your house with water and with gas and electric cause a lot of money. So a person says, hey, I want you people to pay attention to how much water you're using to make wudu. People are going to say you're being rough and tough, you're bakhil, you're stingy, when in fact that individual is following the sunnah and he's saving himself some money. So the point is, if there was a person, a father, a mother, someone, the community, someone who put pressure on people, don't waste water when making wudu. Someone goes in that bathroom, akramakumullah, he sees people making wudu, and he makes inkar on the people and say, hey people, what are you doing? The people are going to say, he's strange, this person is difficult, because we all take it for granted, when I take a shower, I'm going to use enough water for 30, 40, 50 people to make wudu or ghusl and so forth and so on. That's the ghurba of al-Islam. It's not just some of the people thinking, I'm on the right aqidah, I'm on the right minhaj, so I'm with the firqa tanaji and everybody else got problems. Practicing Islam correctly, practicing Islam correctly will make an individual someone who's going to ruffle people's feathers and they're going to ruffle his feathers as well because what Islam is saying and what the people are doing, two different things. So with that being the case, the qurba of al-Islam, how do we stop it? I gave a khutbah here a while ago about another mu'jizah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he told us Islam was going to fade away. And to the point where we won't even know our religion. This Salat of Al-Juma, the Muslim kid won't even know at some point, what is Juma? People won't even know. What is Juma? The only thing that people will be holding on to at that time is, La ilaha illallah. How is that possible? It's possible when, again, this hadith of the Qurba, if we don't do something about changing the condition, like for an example, when we're ignorant about the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and his religion, it becomes easy for things to pass us by. Abdullah ibn Abbas, in complaining about the time of Al-Ghurba, during the time of the companions, he said about the people during his time, مَا مِنْ عَامٍ إِلَّا فِيهِ بِدْعَةً وَأَمَاتُوا فِيهِ سُنَّةً There is not a year 
except every year the people are inventing and introducing innovations in the religion. And every year they are taking out and losing aspects of the sunnah. He said to the point where the innovation is going to live and the sunnah is going to die. The sunnah is going to die. So we stop the process by taking opportunities like this to remind ourselves of the importance of educating ourselves in the religion. Coming to know about the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there are some sunnahs that I want to talk to you about today. And there are many. They have been abandoned. They are mahjura. Not only are they mahjura, abandoned, but some people don't even know this was a sunnah. And if I don't take time like this, and if you don't take time like that, then when are the people going to know? One of the companions, his name is Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajali, radiallahu anhu, said, Bayatu an nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nushi li kulli muslim. He said, I came to the Nabi and I gave him the bayat. And the bayat that I gave him was, Ya Rasulullah, I'm going to give advice to every Muslim that I see. That was his bayah. He's going to be responsible for that in front of Allah, Yawm al-Qiyam, around his neck. Where is that sunnah? Where is that sunnah of all of these people who are here, and I haven't advised, me, you, I haven't advised a single person from this ummah. That's a sunnah that's mahjura, that the person has it in his head. Any and everybody that I see, if I see something that I perceive as being Wrong, I see something that I perceive as needing to be changed, altered, dealt with. I'm going to talk about it. Where is that sunnah? The way things are right now is, nafsi, nafsi. I just got to worry about myself. I don't, I don't have to worry about other people. If we remain like that, the sunnah of an nasiha, it will die, it will die. Look at this, Ikhwani, look at this. Prophet Muhammad was in his masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Look at the sunnah that is mahjura, it's abandoned. Some people don't even know. He was in his masjid after Salati came out of his masjid and he saw an occurrence that was normal. The men and the women came out of the masjid and they were mixing naturally going down the street. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke out to the women and he said to the women, hey you women, the middle of the street is not for you. But you women, in situations like this, when men are on the street, you should walk to the edge. You should walk on the edge of the buildings. The narrator of the hadith said, after the prophet told us that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we used to see the women that when they walked down the street, they would go to the side and sometimes one of them, their clothes would be, get caught on one of the buildings or part of the building. Did your wife know? Did your sister, your auntie know? Did my wife know when they go down Coventry Road, the Nabi of Al Islam brought a religion that told them the best place, the safest place for them to walk is on the side? Of course, she has to use her brain. She has to use her common sense. Sometimes walking the side can pose some problems because, like I said, on Coventry Road, there are tables in front of restaurants. So we're not going to tell her walk behind the table. She has to use her brain. But the point that I'm making here is. Did the Muslim woman know in Al Islam something as ordinary and mundane as walking down the street? She shouldn't walk down the middle of the street, or does she just go down the middle of the street without knowing anything at all? If she didn't know, she's not responsible. She's not responsible. But once she knows, if there are men and women in the street, then the lady should be on the side. Again, that's an example of the many sunnin that have been abandoned. I read a book. And there are multiple books that have gathered these sunnin, the abandoned sunnahs of salat, of zakat, of al-hajj, of the way we dress, the abandoned sunnin of the masjid. The mu'allif, or the author of the book, he came up with 11, 1,125. I don't have to agree with him on everyone, but it is a lot of what people are not doing, and we don't even know. For an example, today. Today, today, today. Today, Khwani, is a tremendous day. As you all know, I don't have to tell you that, but I will say to you, the time has to come where we're going to make this Friday the way it is in the Muslim world. Because in the Muslim world, you know it's Friday. 
just the way the people are, the way the life is. Even if you work in the Muslim world, you know it's Friday. If we don't do it, pretty soon Friday is not going to have any meaning to it. And this is the day of the Eid. So from the Sunan, look at this. And it happens in our message. I've been here 10 years. This continues to happen. After 10 years, it's still happening every week. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man ghassala yawm al-jum'ati wa ghtasala wa bakkara wa ptakara wa masha wa lam yarkab wa dana min al-imam wa stama'a wa lam yalgu kana lahu bi kulli khutwatan amaru sinatan ajru asiyamuha wa qiyamuha any Muslim on the Friday who takes a shower, he takes a shower and he leaves early from his house for Friday. He left an hour before Juma started, not right before Juma begins. He left early. He took a shower. He left early. He walked to the masjid and he didn't ride. When he came to the masjid, he came as close to the imam as possible. He sat down and he didn't make any noise. He took care of his business. Anyone who does that. For every step he takes, right and left, he comes from Coventry Road. It takes him 150 steps to get from Coventry Road to this masjid. Rasulullah said for every step that he takes, he's going to get the reward for every step of fasting one year and praying one year. You come into this masjid like the companions. If the companions were to come into this masjid before the Juma began, they may see three rows have been filled up. But then there's a person sitting right here, right here on this wall. There's another one sitting in that corner and another one sitting over there. The companion will come into this masjid and look at those three people and say, something is wrong with this. Something is wrong with these people. Something has happened. It's like going around the Kaaba. Everybody's going to go counterclockwise. But when we see someone going the other way, we're going to say, something is wrong with him. He's either trying to get out of the masjid, he doesn't know, he's a troublemaker. He's, we're not going to see that as being normal. So for the one who sat over there, over there, these are the sunnah of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the companions will look at this as being something strange because it wasn't present during their time. So don't put yourself out of the box. That's just an example, ikhwani. From the sunnah al-mahjura, on this day, the Nabi mentions sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to everybody here. We have to ask ourselves, where are we with this particular sunnah on this auspicious day? Akthiru alayya as-salat yawm al-jum'ati fa innu laysa ahadun yusalli alayya yawm al-jum'ati illa uridat alayya salatu. He said, say upon me, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Say upon me, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on Friday. Say that for me. And say it a lot. Because anybody who says that on Friday, his, sala his salams will be brought to me and I'll be exposed to them. Now, reading Surah Al-Kahf is a sunnah that's mahjura. It's abandoned. Most people ain't going to do it. But I do understand the Muslim lady has three children. She's running behind those kids on Friday getting them ready for this and that, cleaning up the houses, and she doesn't read Arabic. She's an ajami. I can understand how she finds it difficult to complete the Quran. Someone comes, he wakes up in the morning, he goes to work, he gets out, he comes home, he comes to Juma, he goes back to work, he gets off, he's busy on Friday, he didn't read Surah Al-Kaf, 110 ayat. I can understand that to a degree. 110 ayat? But all he has to do is say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he doesn't do that for the whole day. Every Friday is the same way. Every, but the Friday has to be a thing that in his mind, this is something that I have to do. This is something I have to increase. This is something that my kids have to be aware of. Because if I don't do it, and I don't make them aware of it, if we don't do it, Islam is going to fade away. Bit by bit, by bit, by bit, until finally it's gone. And something like this is fundamental, basic, elementary. On the Friday is the hour. Some of the scholars said it's close to Maghrib time, that last hour before Maghrib. If a person makes a dua during that particular hour, his dua is accepted. Who makes that dua? Who takes the time out? Everybody between yourself. I'm not judging anybody and I'm not putting anybody down. 
I'm saying, ask yourself, when's the last time we made that dua? Look what the companions used to be upon Ikhwani concerning another issue. That was from the sunnah that the companions were upon. And wallahi, we need it more than them. Ridwanullahi alayhim. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha in teaching the people of this community during that time, she said, Inni la astagrab min ahadikum yatawaddu min al ta'am al tayyib wa la yatawaddu min al karimat al khabitha. She said, I find it strange that you people will make wudu after eating food that is pure, meaning the camel. If you have wudu and you eat the camel, which is from the tayyibat and it's halal, you have to make wudu. She said, I find it strange that you people will make wudu from eating the camel's meat, but one of you won't make wudu after saying a bad word. After saying something that's not acceptable, a curse word, a swear word, something that you know is a problem. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, when they told him what Aisha said, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, that's right. He said, she said, well, it's right. For me to make wudu after saying a bad word, Something not good, something nasty, because I said a bad word that's more beloved to me than making wudu after eating camel's meat. So the point here is, the people of this community from a long time ago, if one of them said something that was inappropriate, if one of them said a word that was not in its proper place, you know, like the curse words that we use, the nasty things we say to people and what we use, one of them will make wudu in order to be a kafara for the kalima al khabitha Muhammad ibn Sarin from the tabi'in he mentioned al wudu min al qawl al munkir you should make wudu when you say something that's bad he said this is from the sunnah one of the companions of the prophet al bura ibn azib he said sometimes this is from the sunnah sometimes I make the same salah. I make salat al dhuhr asr al maghrib with the same wudu. Except if I break my wudu or I say a word that's inappropriate. He has wudu, but he said something that's inappropriate. He will go and make wudu. Whoever made that particular wudu? There are different wudu to make in Islam. Different ones. Who from amongst us ever in his life made a wudu after seeing something that was inappropriate? Well, I didn't know that was from the sunnah. The reason I didn't know that was from the sunnah because I didn't, it just didn't come my way yet. And that, how many things are, this is the case. Many things that didn't come our way yet. And they won't come your way if we don't make efforts. You came to the masjid, you made an effort. So now the knowledge of that sunnah came your way. That those people in the past, that companion said, I'll make Salat al-Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and I have the same wudu. But if I break my wudu, or if I say a word that's inappropriate, I'll go and I'll make my wudu. I'll make my wudu. Even though he still has his wudu to make kafara for that kalam. So during the time that we're living, there's a lot of bad kalam that we make. Nadir. Very seldom will you find an individual who he's not saying bad things. Very seldom. Most people, many people are saying bad things. How many people are making the sunnah? Which brings us to another one. And this one is Jiddin, Jiddin Muhim in Sayyid Bukhari. Prophet Muhammad told us about our condition, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, ma min rajulin yudhnibu dhambin thumma yaqumu fa yatatahir thumma yusalli rakatain thumma yastaghfiru allaha illa ghafar allahu lahu. He said, there is no man no person, man, woman, no teenager, there's no person who, they commit a sin, whatever the sin is, they commit a sin. And then after committing that sin, they get up and they make wudu. And then they pray to rakah. And then they ask Allah to forgive them, except that Allah will forgive them. That salat is called salat at toba Salat at toba it's from the many prayers in Al-Islam. Salat at toba I never heard that prayer before. I never knew that there was a Salat at toba Yep, there's a Salat at toba in Sayyid al-Bukhari, and this is it. A man makes a mistake, a lady makes a mistake. 
gets into an argument, says something that's wrong. She disrespects her husband. He says something to his wife that's not appropriate against the dean. He didn't pray. Something happened. Made a mistake. Make wudu. Pray to our guys. Ask Allah to forgive you for that particular mistake. Salat toba. How many people made that salat? One time in their life. One time in their life. I know the hadith. You know the hadith. Kullu bani Adam khattaun. All of Adam's children, they make mistakes. Everybody make mistakes here. But here, here in this masjid, how many people here who made mistakes? How many of us made Salat al-Tawbah? One time, one time. Just once. And the list goes on, Ikhwani. The point here is, I didn't come to try to tell you about those 1,123, 25 Sunan Mahjura that one particular author spoke about. I, I can't tell you about all of that. But what I did come to try to impress upon you is the Qurba of Al-Islam, it is going to increase and increase and increase. The destruction of Al-Islam is going to continue and continue and continue. And it's not our religion to just say, okay, we're just going to hang it up. This is the Qadr and we got... No, everybody has to do something to try to prevent that. So come to know about the Sunan and Mahjura by simply just reading about your religion. And especially today, with knowledge today, all you have to do, Abdullah, in Arabic or in English, all you have to do is go to Google and put in Google as Sunan and Mahjura in Arabic. All you have to do is put in English the abandoned sunnas. And you're going to get before you, inshallah, azawajal, those things that come to you. Hopefully, you'll follow those things that have the delil. And with Allah's help, inshallah, we can start to do something about delaying or even turning the tide of this particular issue. Aqula qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa nas'al Allah ta'ala at tawfiq wa sadat. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. In closing, I don't want anybody to walk away from this ministry today with the opinion or the impression that I'm saying I'm better than all of you guys or that I, by myself, I'm doing all of the sunan and mahjura. I just want to encourage you to open up your eyes. I mentioned in our masjid right here concerning our youth, our shabab, and the people who see GLM as being their local masjid. We think that we need to raise our level of ghira in this masjid, our level of jealousy and concern when things are happening in the masjid. It's everybody's responsibility to make al amr maruf and al al munkar in the right way. And we have to start with this issue of the prayer. We have to start with this issue of the prayer. Our prayer in this masjid is lacking. It is the salat al in many instances. So we got to take responsibility, everybody who's here, but especially those people who are the core community members. Like, this is your community. You don't come in and go out. You don't use it as an access in a walkway. But this is the community that you come to. So let us take care of all of these issues. Waste and water. Let us take care of that issue. The issue of waste and water. The issue of the children giving the people a hard time when they're trying to pray. There's just so many issues. But in saying that, we have to address the issues with hikmah. We have to address the issues with ra'fa and with rahman being easy with rifq. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal wa Ta'ala to make it easy for us and easy for you. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to protect us and to protect our Islam, our Islam. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it easy for us to make it possible so that our shabab, our youth, our family, They'll continue to grow up on El Islam, but it's the Islam that he's pleased with, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only these things are possible. Ikhwani, we put an effort, we ask Allah for his dua. We make dua to Allah to make us of those who are successful. Donate generously to the masjid, and don't forget tonight, inshallah, there is a talk concerning why the causes that cause the lowliness of the ummah. Aqam as-salat, ya